So this time, uh, I'll try to consider the few examples. So far, we have discussed the theory related to the crystal plasticity, or maybe that is the crystal plasticity part one. So uh, here, we'll focus some of the associated uh, numerical problems uh, with the theory. Let us look into this thing one by one. And first, we'll to the example one. Here, you can see that determine whether the dislocation reaction is feasible or not. So here the dislocation reaction is given B1 equal to B2 plus B3. And we can see that uh, magnitude of the uh, Burgers vector also given. And here from this reaction, we will try to investigate the feasibility of this reaction of dislocation. So to do that, since B1, B2 represented in terms of vector, and first we try to consider the components of the uh, these vectors on x, y, z coordinates, and we we'll try to make them balance. If we try to make it balance the components in the left hand side and the right hand side individually, x, y, and z axis, and then if matches with, then we can say that the reaction is feasible. So this is the very thumb rule to do first checking to whether B1 equal to B2 plus B3 uh, that means vector that means whether this equation is valid or not. This is the first checking of the feasibility of the reaction. So here you see the x component left hand side that is the uh, 0 but right hand side if we see the component You see the right hand side this component and these two components and here that means a by 6 and minus a by 6 because the Miller indices is given minus 1 in the right hand side of the second term. So 1 by 6 minus 1 by 6 so a is the lattice parameter is maybe common from the both the sides so we can consider 1 by 6 minus 1 by 6 that is 0 that means it is satisfying. Let us look into the y components here and from these vectors left hand side and right hand side. So uh, left hand side the vector actually becomes minus half and right hand side if we look into that it is the from the first component it becomes minus 2 by 6 and from the second component it becomes minus 1 by 6 and it becomes minus half. That means it is also satisfying. This is satisfying and second component it is also satisfying. Now if you look into the z component, z component if you see the left hand side it is the plus half and two components from the right hand side it comes 1 by 6 plus 2 by 6 that it becomes half. That means z components also it is satisfying. So this is the first checking for the feasibility of the reaction. Now we look into the second checking on that for the dissociation to be feasible to form the reaction. In this case we need to satisfy B1 square greater than B2 square plus B3 square and that B1 corresponding this actually that square term is comes from the uh, amount of the estimated energy and that actually this this terms comes that dislocation energy uh, roughly half of G B square. So 
So half of gv square and from that that v square terms actually comes. So first we see that what is the energy for uh, <coughs> left hand side. So we will try to find out the magnitude of the Burger vector that is bu1 equal to a by 2 and the root over of the component is given 0, minus 1 and 1 square. From here we can find out the root 2 a by 2 is the magnitude of the Barker spectrum and square term of this is basically a square by 2. Now similarly we can find out the magnitude of the Barker spectrum b2 and b3 in similar way or maybe we can say the magnitude of this vector and from there we can find out b2 square and b3 square and if we check it then if we see find out the b1 square is actually greater than of the summation of the b2 square and b3 square. So this indicates that two checking satisfied here. So we can say that the dislocation reaction is feasible in this case. Now we shift to the next problem. Here if you see, if you look into that problem, it is explained that a sample of aluminum is having dislocation density equal to 10 to the power 12 1 by meter square. The average distance between dislocations is 10 to the power minus 6 meter and the radius of dislocation core is approximately equal to the magnitude of Burger spectrum. So we have to estimate the total amount of the energy per meter cube associated with dislocation and assume that with the sample that half of the dislocations are edge dislocation and half 50 percent is the screw, dis, screw dislocations. And second we have to find out that what would be the temperature rise if we consider of the, all this energy associated with this dislocation can be released as heat. To do that first here we just we can look into that. So dislocation density is basically the unit of the dislocation density is here 1 by meter square that how it comes so dislocation density means we can find out that dislocation is measured actually in terms of the length so that density means total dislocation the length divided by the volume so when you divide the length divided by the volume then the unit becomes 1 by meter square now here the size of the core is given that it is given that uh, r0 equal r0 equal to that uh, equal to the magnitude of the burgers vector that means r0 equal to b it is given that r0 equal to b here and capital r is given but point is that how we can estimate uh, capital R uh, that can be estimated like that the average distance between average distance between two dislocation is given so then effect of the one dislocation can be assumed that the existence of the the midpoint between the two dislocations so that's why capital R that means upper limit of the dislocation uh, dislocation uh, energy is limited to the capital R that is half of the distance between the two dislocation that means 0 0.5 into 10 to the power minus 6 meter in this case. So once we define capital R small size of the core then we can easily estimate the what is the amount of the energy associated with the screw dislocation and edge dislocation in this case. So once we estimate because other parameters are given the associated energy with the screw and edge dislocation then we can find out that 
what may be the total energy. Now, here when we use this formula of the energy associated with the dislocation, we can see that this formula actually given the energy per unit length. So, when we multiply by the dislocation density, then the units becomes, for example, in SI into dislocation density is having the unit 1 by meter square. So, basically the joule per meter cube. That means the total energy when you multiply the dislocation density within the sample itself, then it represents that the amount of energy per unit volume. So, to do that, you can see that within the sample itself, the existence of the dislocation is like that. The 50 percent of the dislocation is the AS dislocation and 50 percent of the screw dislocation. So, that is why the WEL is the amount of energy calculated for the AS dislocation and the 50 percent we consider we multiply by the half of the density that is the 50 percent of the dislocation is associated with the AS dislocation and another 50 percent is associated with the screw dislocation. So, finally, we can find out the half of rho into the energy associated with the screw and S and that is the unit length. So, this this amount of energy actually represents the amount of energy per unit volume. This is the first answer of the first question. The second question is that if all the dislocation energy is converted to the heat energy, then how we can estimate, how we can solve this problem? What may be the temperature rise in this case? Now, if suppose there is a transformation of the one dislocation energy to the heat energy, in this case the amount of the heat energy is estimated is the rho Cp delta T. So, this rho is actually not the dislocation density, this rho is actually the density of the specific material and this is the material property of that uh, and Cp is the specific heat and delta T is the temperature rise. So, you can check the units also whether the units consistency is there then we can find out easily the temperature rise. So, you see the density of the material is a in SI unit kg per meter cube and specific heat is a joule per kg Kelvin and suppose increment of the temperature is in Kelvin. So, that actually represents joule per meter cube. So, in the sense this actually represents the amount of the heat energy for unit volume. So, once this is also this also represents the amount of energy per unit volume. So, in this case maybe we can make it equal total energy and the heat energy and from that we can find out what is the increment of the temperature if others data are available for this problem. Now, we shift to the third problem. Here, if we consider an aluminum single crystal that has been stretched in tension applied to the axis x by 250 kilo Pascal in compression parallel to the y axis that is 0 1 0 and by 50 kilo Pascal and with 0 kilo Pascal in the z direction. Basically, z direction there is no load, no stress. Now, assume, assume that slip occurred on the 1 1 1 plane in the 1 minus 1 0 direction and only on the, the that slip system. Also, assume that the strains are very small. So, basically, it is a small strain problem. And if the crystal were strain until some specified uh, normal strain along x direction is 0 0.01 then what, may, what would be the strain along y direction and the angle be between the tensile axis and 1 minus 1 0 direction. So, to solve that first we can define the x, y and z axis on the unit cell. So, x direction represents 1 0 0 that is Miller index of x y direction 0 1 0 and z also 0 0 1. So, define that x y z axis. Now, the stress straight is like that sigma x equal to 250 kilo Pascal 
sigma y equal to 50 kilo Pascal and sigma z equal to 0. And slip system is defined as 1 1 1 plane and 1 minus 1 0 direction. So, when you try to estimate the resolved shear stress in a single crystal structure, we define the slip plane is the one specific plane and the slip direction we define as a D here. And normal to the slip plane direction actually represents the 1 1 1. If we, if we know that if 1 1 1 is the slip plane, so that normal to that slip plane is, is the direction of basically 1 1 1 same index, but it is it indicates the direction. So once n the normal to the slip plane direction define d along direction in which direction the slip occurs and we define the x, y and z direction and x, y and z direction is subjected to the amount this is the that they are maybe subjected to a different type of stress state that along x direction sigma x along y direction sigma y and along z direction sigma z. Now once we can estimate these things. Now we can estimate the incremental strain, very small strain along x direction is basically the we need to consider the direction cosines L and x and L dx here and this is the gamma nd is basically the amount of the shear strain on that slip plane. Actually the shear strain on the slip in is basically independent of the amount of the uh, external stress or strain. Similarly, this we can find found out the increment of the strain along y direction also by looking into the direction cosines and we can link into the uh, uh, strain on the slip plane and but this actually estimation is comes from the very base first uh, module where we can estimate the transformation of the axis and we can represent the relation between the uh, stress strain step between the two axis in terms of the direction cosines. Now how to define the direction, how to estimate uh, mathematically the direction cosine L n x is simply we know the x direction and n direction have already defined and then from these two vectors maybe we can estimate that direction cosines is like that say suppose u1 v1 and w1 and u2 v2 and w2 is the two direction when we found out that u1 u2 plus v1 v2 plus w1 w2 by root over of u1 square v1 square plus w1 square into u2 square v2 square plus w. this formula we have already derived uh, we have already shown that how we can estimate this amount of the uh, direction cosines. So once we can estimate the direction cosines, it can be like that ln x equal to 1 by root 3 l dx ln y l dy. So that means direction cosine based on the direction d and y that is defined by the l dy in this case. Now once we define the direction cosines, we put it here and we can find out that amount of the increment of the strain along x and y direction and we found out the ratio is coming minus 1 so that d epsilon y is same as the d epsilon x but in the negative magnitude and this is the way the answer of the first question that if the crystal strain limit is un until point one, 0 0.01 then what may be the strain along y direction? So, strain along y direction is this one. Now, second question is that what uh, the angle be between the tensile axis and 1 minus 1 0 in these two directions, how we can estimate the angle? So, tensile axis in this case, if we see the problem that already defined that 2 kilopascal is applied <coughs> in the x direction and that is in tensile load. So that means we have to find out the angle between the x axis and 1 minus 1 0. So x axis 
that is defined 1 0 0 and minus 1 Oh, sorry, 1 minus 1, 0. 1 minus 1, 0. These two directions you can find out easily. So, you can find out that cos phi between x and d uh, multiplying by this component 1, 1, 1 and other components are 0 upper side and lower side root over of 1 plus 1 and other cases root over of 2. So, it becomes 1 by 2. So, phi becomes 45 degrees. So, this is the way we can estimate the angles between the two axes and if there exists some slip system and which direction slip occurs and how, how, to, how, how to know the normal to the slip plane and, and, <coughs> and which direction the slip will occurs. So, this kind of problems when we try to solve these things first we need to define completely what are the different axis x, y, z axis then we need to define that slip direction d axis and then we need to define the normal to the slip plane n axis. So, once we define all this axis system then systematically we can estimate the uh, different uh, direction cosines and from in terms of the direction cosines we can correlate the amount of the stress or amount of the strain and finally we can solve this problem. Now, we try to next problem is that here compare the relative energies of dislocation with perfect Barger's vector. Perfect Barger's vector in the sense that dislocation of the unit strength actually represented by the perfect Barger's vector and that Barger's vector is actually represented in the shortest repeat distance in case of the simple cubic structure. So, with perfect Barker's vector along 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 0 direction in case of aluminum. We know the aluminum is having FCC crystal structure and the lattice parameter of aluminum is also given here. If the stored energy in a copper crystal due to strain fields of dislocation is this one, then calculate its dislocation density. So, first thing is that first problem how we can solve it that compare the relative energies of dislocation with perfect Burger's vector. So, that since here to solve this problem we know that amount amount of the energy is basically half of g b square. But remember here this problem we are not explicitly defined what is the size of the core. When that data are not available, we can assume that the amount of the uh, energy associated with the dislocation is simply representation E equal to half of G B square. So, that energy is per unit length, but in this case G is the shear modulus, it is a material property we can easily define or it is it can be defined, it should be given here or it should be known. And second is the Burger's vector, but we need to estimate the Burger's vector for aluminum in this case, aluminum is having FCC crystal structure and lattice parameter also given. So, perfect Burger's vector in this case can be considered as the shortest repeat distance. That means, along the phase diagonal, the half of the phase diagonal that is the shortest repeat distance, he represents the Burger's vector. So, that Burger's vector is basically root 2 A0 A by 2 half of that. This is the perfect Burger's vector and A is, A is given here and he, from here we can find out the Burger's vector. So, once we estimate the Burger's vector, we can estimate the amount of the energy associated at the perfect Burger's vector in different directions. But point is here that we can easily find out the perfect Burger's vector along one, one, one direction. But what may be the perfect Burger's vector if we, if we consider that there existence of the perfect Burger's vector along 100 zero, zero direction, 
In this case, we need to find out what is the shortest repeat distance along 100 direction and we have to find out the shortest repeat distance along 110 direction. Then we can estimate the Barker's vector in all the in, in case of FCC structure. And once we estimate the Barker's vector, then we can find out the amount of the strain energy. Now, second part of these things, if the if the stored energy in the copper crystal due to strain fields of the dislocation is given, a some kilojoule per unit volume is given, calculates its dislocation density. So once, so that means the amount of the energy, actually stored energy, stored energy is given here. Uh, say for example stored energy is w so that stored energy actually given per unit volume and we know that e is the strain energy per unit volume that is for example e so in this case it is g joule per meter that actually ratio represents the dislocation density so with this relation can find out that what is the uh, sorry we can in this case we can find out what is the dislocation density in this case we need we we are just simply tracking the units consistency to solve this kind of problem so it is like that only physically if we consider this is small sample of the materials and within that sample of the materials there exists the several dislocations so when there is existence of the several dislocation and we try to estimate the amount of the energy associated with the dislocations, then we need to consider the what is the dislocation density with that sample. So that can be linked and then we, we have already estimated the amount of the energy associated with the single dislocations. So once the single dislocation energy is associated and the total, so for a, a sample what is the amount of the total energy, then we have to link with the dislocation density to find out the amount of the energy associated with the for the whole sample. So that is why it is simply looking into the unit's consistency, the relation between the dislocation density and the amount of the energy associated with the single dislocation and amount of the energy measured as a bulk from the whole sample. Second pro next problem we will try to look into that, the calculate the concentration of the vacancies at room temperature, basically here we are going back to the problem related to the crystal imperfections or crystal defects. So that how we can solve this problem that concentration of the vacancy is in the copper at a room temperature as a bulb. So here you see we have already know, uh, so we have already explained that the amount of the vacancy uh, in case of crystal structure can be represented by this type of equation where nv equal to n exponential minus qv by rt. So basically that qv is the activation energy to create the uh, defects like vacancy. Uh, r is the characteristic gas constant, c is the temperature and but what is the n here? In what way you can represent the n here? Now here the temperature is given is the room 25 degree. So when you try to solve this problem and it is better to use the temperature unit in terms of the Kelvin not in the degree centigrade. So we are converting the temperature unit in terms of the Kelvin. Then we can find out the what is the number of atoms per unit volume. So the calculate the concentration of vacancies in a copper. So that N in this cases the N actually represents the vacancies, number of vacancies or number of concentration vacancies that can be considered as a defect per unit volume. So when you try to represent on this per unit volume, how you can do that? In case of copper is having FCC structure. So in FCC structure, what is the total number of atoms per unit cell? Uh, we know that there are four atoms per unit cell. Now what is the volume of the unit cell? 
So volume of the unit cell is basically the A cube. A cube is the lattice parameter. So edge, edge of the, the volume of the cube basically. So then when 4 divided by the A cube, so that actually represents the number of atoms exist per unit volume. Once we convert the number of atoms exist unit volume and we apply the looking at available data, activation energy, what is the temperature is given, R it is known. Then we can find out that number of vacancies the of copper at the room temperature. Actually the number of vacancies it varies depending upon the temperature. If there is a variation of the temperature then actually number of vacancies generally increases. So this calculation can be different if for example what is the number of vacancies of copper if it, it is 100 degree centigrade. Definitely the number of vacancies at 100 degree centigrade will be different. But n actually given is the n actually we have calculated the number of atoms per unit volume uh, looking into the crystal structure at room temperature. Next problem, it is necessary to find out that determine the number of vacancies needed for a BCC iron crystal to have a density of 7.87 gram per centimeter cube. Remember that when you try to measure the density or density we measure for a sample 7.87 gram per centimeter cube and lattice parameter is also given. Now looking into the information of this density we can find out what are the number of vacancies actually needed in a BCC crystal structure to maintain this um, density values of the 7.87 gram per centimeter cube. Here we see rho equal to n a y volume v b c c n is the Avogadro's number. Uh, okay. So n is the n actually represents the atoms per unit cell. So this is a simple formula of estimating the theoretical density of a specific crystal structure. Now since if we know for a specific crystal structure and n, a, v, b, c, c, n the lattice parameter is well defined. So we can easily estimate the theoretical density of our material. Once the material is defined, their crystal structure is also defined, all are defined. But since the this density is actually not exactly the theoretical density of the material, it is some deviation from the theoretical density of the material presence and assuming that presence of vacancies actually there is a change of the density. So to look into that, assuming that there is a x number of atoms exist within the x number of atoms exist for unit cell to compensate the presence of vacancies uh, within the unit cell. So once we do that, rho equal to x a y c and everything and c rho density is given here. From here we can simply calculate what is the x value here. So once x is estimated the 1.9871 atoms per cell. So that means that 2 minus x because 2 is the in perfect crystal structure that without any defects the total number of atoms per unit cell is 2 in case of the BCC structure. So then 2 minus x actually represents that number of atoms per unit cell is basically represents the equivalent to the vacancies presence in that specific sample. So once per unit cell you can know when you multiply that volume of the unit cell then we can say the vacancies per unit volume it may be very high. So one point in this case for typical idea that 1.23 10 to the power 2 number of vacancies exist per 1 centimeter cube volume of in case of BCC st structure. So these are the way to find out the different problems associated with the defense 
or maybe vacancies exist within the crystal structure. So due to the presence of the vacancies, it may not be exactly equal to the theoretical density of a perfect crystal. So this is the one way to estimate the number of vacancies in case of BCC crystal structure when we as a gross measure the density of a specific material. That is the different from the theoretical density of the specific material. If you look into the next problem, here we see that need consider a single crystal of BCC iron oriented such that a tensile stress is applied along 0, 1, 0 direction. So it is well defined. The tensile stress is acting one specific direction of the x among x, y, and z. Compute the resolved shear stress along on on one one zero plane and in a minus one 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 direction when a tensile stress of fifty two megapascal is applied. This is the first problem, and second problem: if slip occurs on that plane and in that direction and critically resolved shear stress is defined then calculate the magnitude of the applied stress necessary to initiate the yielding. So that applied stencil stress should be different from the resolved shear stress and let us look into the first problem how we can solve this problem. So first we define that normal to the 1, 1, 1 plane and 0, 1, 0 direction. So let us look into, uh, define the angle is phi in this case. So that means I can say, suppose this is the slip plane and this is the direction D and this is the axis X and we define the normal to the slip plane is n. So phi is the normal to the slip plane and between the 0, 1, 0 direction means which direction the load is acting. So this is basically phi. A lambda angle between the slip direction d and the x axis, the which direction load is applied. So suppose this is the angle lambda. So once we define phi and lambda and then we know the n, x and d direction simply we can find out cos phi looking into the formula and then we can find out phi equal to 45 degree and here u1, v1, w1, u2, v2, w3 is defined 110 or 010 that means uh, 110 normal to this plane this is n and this is x. So here you can find out phi, similar we can find out lambda also and we can find out, once we find out the lambda, we can find the resolved shear stress on that slip plane is this one, sigma cos phi cos lambda, cos phi cos lambda and sigma is the normal stress is given 52 mega Pascal and finally we can find out that 21.3 mega Pascal is the resolved shear stress along the direction D. Now on the same slip system if the critical results critical critically resolved shear stress is 30 mega Pascal what may be the normal stress is required to start the yielding. So what may be the normal stress acting along the x axis to start the yielding. Similarly replace the tau r resolved shear stress in terms of critically resolved shear stress. So critically resolved shear stress is just about to start the slip process. Then if we put it and we can find out that sigma y equal to 73.4 mega Pascal. That means here if we see the critically resolved shear stress is more than the resolved shear stress. So when critically resolved shear stress we put that limit and we can say this is the just to start the yielding of the material uh, on this on this crystal structure and you can find out which is which is 73.4 which is more than what was the initially it was applied stress was 50 mega Pascal it is more than that of the initial stress value. So if we apply the 73.5 mega Pascal the load it will just to start the 
yielding on the slip plane along the slip directions now look into another problem if you say the a cubic crystal is subjected to the stress state sigma x equal to 15 kilopascal sigma y equal to 0 sigma z equal to 7.5 kilopascal and the shear stress all the shear stress components are 0 and we have defined the x y and z axis now what is the shear stress on the slip system for this type of problem we have already solved but here if we just look into see that when the slip system is defined here we define the slip system means we need to define the slip plane and the slip direction so <coughs> slip plane is defined 1 1 minus 1 that is a plane and direction d is here is basically here we can define the d is basically 1 0 minus 1 and slip plane is 1 1 minus 1 and normal to the slip plane direction n equal to 1 1 minus 1 and we define the x and y and z axis x and z axis we need that now we need to estimate here you can find out the direction cosines l n x between the two axis n and x l d x between d and x axis l n z between n and z axis l d z between d and z axis so we can find out all the direction cosines here now shear stress tau n d can be represented like that that l n x l d x sigma x axis l n z l d z sigma z z this we simply consider the transformation axis rule in terms of the direction cosines and we have not considered the other component stress component because stress component along y direction it is zero and all other shear stress component are zero so that's why out of six component four com four com four component of the stresses are zero then only we consider the two component of the stress and we can solve this problem so here we found out that shear stress on the slip pen is basically 9.186 kilopascal so this is simply way once we define the slip plane and we can find out the uh, stresses acting on the slip plane by considering the uh, this system of uh, <coughs> slip system and defining the different axis or different stress, stress state on, on that specific problem. Now finally we will consider the another problem let us look into this consider the following dislocation reaction in fcc cubic material and the reaction is defined dislocation reactions prove the feasibility of the reactions and second question is the on what plane the dislocation reaction will occur so first thing is the prove the feasibility of the reactions we have already discussed to prove the feasibility of the reactions we try to satisfy the first checking whether it is satisfying the vector sum rule or not that means left hand side and right hand side total components of the x y z components of the vectors are satisfying or not second checking their energy level whether during the reaction whether the energy level decreases or not if both are satisfied then we can say the reaction is feasible now second part on what plane the dislocation reaction will occur so in this case here the assuming that b1 is decompose or maybe into b2 and b3 now b2 and b3 the burgers magnitude burgers vector of b2 and b3 is defined and that two are basically partials so when b2 and b3 is defined if you do the cross product of these two vectors b2 and b3 we can found out that this vector 3i plus 3j minus 3k this indicates actually millenization of this plane is 1 1 minus 1 so simply so that the reaction will basically occur on this plane 1 1 minus 1 so this is the way we can 
check the feasibility of the dissociation of the dislocation and we can define that which plane this reaction uh, to complete reaction will occur that means b1 is the total full length of the dislocation and b2 and b3 are the partials for this dislocations so hopefully we'll be able to understand this uh, crystal part of the first part of the crystal plasticity by looking to the very basic elemental problems associated with the theory and it will be uh, i think it will be helpful to basic understanding of the concept of the dislocations and how the di dislocation is basically is influential to explain the different phenomena specifically the strengthening of the part so these examples are given or explained only to strengthen the knowledge of the application of the very basic elemental theory so far we have learned thank you very much for your kind attention